So, you start off in Armored Warfare and you notice you have a very bare garage. However, how does Spitfire have all these crates? How does Spitfire have an extra two premium vehicles? Well, it turns out there are some Armored Warfare promotional codes that come out. Um, these will be linked down in, in the description for a LAV-15090 code, an ERC-90F4 code which lasts for 30 days, um, and a bunch of crates, as you can see here, which I will unlock, which is three gold crates, 3,000 rep, 10 gold crude insignias, and 10 reputation insignias. So, how do we use them? Well, um, insignias are here which will boost my crew um, XP by 40% which isn't particular of use on these two vehicles here and these are on tier 1's however it might be good to save them however reputation boost should be used on premium vehicles such as let's say the LOV150 here or the ERC90 when you start off in Armored Warfare things will be very basic I'm afraid um, you will have the option to do a tutorial, which I haven't done yet on either account, um, but it doesn't really matter that much to be honest. Um, as you see here, there are a fuck ton of vehicles in the game. My recommendations of the line to start off with would be the Russian line. Um, you go from the PT-76 here to the T-55, which is okay, the T-62, which is these the T the T62 kind of sets off the line of having a relatively powerful gun, but the T64A here is the real deal. It is the best MBT in tier four, with um, the best armor um, and the highest damaging gun, except for the Chieftain with Hesh. The same goes for the T64A 1976, and then later off you also want to go down the rest of the T80 line here. So T80, T80B, T80U. Then still using AF, uh, MBTs here, you're going to want to go down to the British line. This is using the Chieftain with Hesh. Another Chieftain with Hesh. The Chieftain 900 is a bit of a crap tank, but nothing can help there. And you'll probably want to go to the Challenger 1. Um, the Arietti will require some patience to go through, since it is a tank that is very easily ammo racked. But the Challenger 1 and the Challenger 2 ATTU are quite nice, having the highest front of armour in the game and also being relatively difficult to destroy as well. Um, although you don't really need to with the Arietti there, uh, you could always get yourself a Terminator, maybe a Thunderbolt, maybe even the T90MS if you want. The, T the T90MS is a fun tank, and the uh, T14 Armada is definitely a good vehicle as well. Uh, AFV lines, um, in my honest opinion, uh, AFEs can be generally difficult for new players. Um, this is quite difficult to be honest. Um, I would say go down the BMD line, um, as these are generally more firepower or oriented ones, with a BMD1, BMB1P um, having some pretty high damage in missiles and cannons, enabling you to do about 1000 to 1100 damage. Um, and then the BMD2, BMD4, BMD2, these are more like recon or oriented vehicles, but they can pack a hell of a punch. Uh, the BMD2 having a relatively fast firing missile, um, the BMD4 having the highest missile speed in, the, um, in its tier with like a reload of 5 seconds or something, and having a 100mm gun allowing you to do extremely high damage to AFVs, and then the BMD2M having also some of the highest damaging missiles in its tiers and also being a relatively stealthy vehicle. From then on you can go to the Ramkers, Terminator, T-15, Armada. Um, these two will probably need Hesh, um, sorry Thermo Barracks, um, but they are very well suited for brawling and they are very fun vehicles to play. Um, they also have the option of taking regular missiles which can put a hurt on just about everything in their tier except for probably the Challenger 2s. Um, and then lastly the T-15 Armada is also extremely fun as well however it is very vulnerable however you could go, you could go down the light tank line um, all of them are very powerful options in their own right um, the scorpion only being let down by slow muzzle velocity the scorpion 90 having hess shells extremely powerful ap shells and a 
pretty solid vehicle in its own right. You get up to the Sheridan, just fire heat shells at everything, it's hilarious. You could go for the Bagel Panzer, but that's not recommended. Uh, with these two Stingrays here basically being better than the tank destroyers in their own tiers with powerful speed and guns. The Stingray 2 having some very obnoxious armor. Um, and then the Buford and the Thunderbolt um, kind of taking the gameplay of, 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 of the Stingrays but doing it in, in into a more um, DPM oriented game. Um, the Thunderbolt and the Buford here basically being auto loaders um, that never have to reload. They have extremely fast reload times. I wouldn't recommend going for the PLR one. While it does have extremely high protection versus um, missiles and heat rounds, uh, AP rounds is a lot to be desired. By then you have a lot of options in the game, you could continue to go up the Russian line here, which is some relatively powerful vehicles with good guns, or you could go back to, or you could go onto the Wolfie line. Uh, the American line is actually pretty shit at the moment. Um, highlights of this line being the Leopard 1, um, with heat shells, which is probably the, the best MBT in its tier. Uh, the tank destroyer line, uh, the Dragoon 90 here is very powerful. Um, the LAV 300 not so much, same for the ERC. The LAV 600 is kind of okay, but it's when you get to the Centauri 105 that if you're already used to the Stingrays, you kind of play it like that, but a lot more laid back. As you can see, there's a discount going on. Uh, the Striker is also quite fun, but does require a lot of use. And then the Centauri 120, in PvP, it's a monster, um, but in PvE, um, the Draco is better. You also have the option of a another AFE, hello I'm recording, line here. Um, in terms of Mare ones, the Dragon is basically shit. Um, there's no point taking it, it has extremely bad gun depression. It's like Chinese. I can't do something, which. Yes. Why? The webcam isn't on. I think, let me check. It isn't. Okay. The Dragon does have some good missiles, but generally speaking, uh, the lack of gun depression and the backwards mounted turret, like World of Tanks. Tanks with. They had this shit in World of Tanks. Do you remember the Chinese line with the bad gun depression? crash and be like, oh hey I'm on a hill, congratulations, the only thing I can shoot at is the moon. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Uh, and then the Draco is a monster in PvE and it finally has um, a unmanned turret, meaning you won't get instapot by the AI. The real highlights of this line, to be honest, is probably going to be the BMP3 and the BMP3M. Um, kind of like the BMD4, except they have better protection. Um, more hit points I believe and still the same very fast missile reload. Zhangfeng's line here with the Chinese line um, it's a little bit meh here um, the Type 80 does have ERA and I think the Type 79 does as well but they are not exactly that good compared to the T64's uh, the same going for the Type 85 here however it's this line that is probably the most fun um, all of them Except I believe the 9910 having engine boost, having extremely high DPM for their tier. And then you can get on to the 99As, which are the best MBTs in the game at the moment, frontally. Um, they are basically impenetrable. You could go for artillery, but for the most part, to be honest, it's a PvE only oriented class. And there is little point to using them, simply because uh, I'd rather have someone who can fire shells uh, all, all the time rather than someone who, who can only shoot like once every 15 seconds or something. It's not very good. Uh, this line here, um, these three vehicles here aren't exactly that good, but the BVP and the Rosamac generally stand out because they're extremely powerful missiles. And I mean the ability to just auto lock on people and slap them in the face for a thousand damage. Uh, shout out to the WP Anders here for being possibly one of the best light tanks in the game. This is a light tank with extremely good frontal armor, an unmanned turret, and good gun depression, and an autoloader. Um, I wouldn't really say go go for the Wilk. And then lastly, we get, we get we get to this line here, which requires deal seventy five thousand damage using light tanks five plus in random battles, um, or deal six hundred thousand damage using light tanks in PvE. However, these aren't, um, I believe you could just simply go all the way up, um, or you could just do it one by one I think. 
um, shout out for the NM142 being an extremely fun little vehicle. It's it, it's uh, it's called the Pedo Gavin, um, simply because it molests the fuck out of everything. And then the Sprut here is also, generally speaking, it's a better dragon. It says it it it's it says it's a tank destroyer, but it's far faster. Um, it has no armor whatsoever, but an extremely good camo, especially with with Aaron O'Connell. And it's just a very fun vehicle overall to play. Um, the K21 is kind of a Wilk. Um, it's, it has it has better mobility and better survivability, but the Wilk has access to Peli. And then the Corner AM here. To be honest, it's worse than the Sphinx generally um, for PV for PVP for PVE and for Glops. Uh, the Sphinx just kills it. The Sphinx having um, being able to be more controllable. Um, it has more flexibility and it has a very good auto cannon, while the Cornet does not. In terms of premiums, uh, I would mostly forget these simply because, well, you have an LAV-90 already in the form of the Dragoon, um, and if you use the bonus code, well, congratulations, you already have one. Uh, the MBT-70 I won't really go for, but the AMX-10 um, RCI is a very good vehicle, um, being able to basically uh, double tap everything. It has literally like a cycle time of a second or something so you can do a thousand damage to people which offsets the low to penetration um this isn't really great to be honest generally speaking uh the mark of a 2d is probably the best option out of all of these um especially for pve uh with the access to the ready rack it has a lot of hit points and it's generally quite noob friendly um, it might be a little difficult to use in PvP, but remember you have that ready rack, and, and, and if you can stop people from shooting at your obvious front weak spot, you're basically golden most of the time. It also has uh, the ability to resist missiles from the side. Um, I wouldn't really say go for any of these. The WZ-1, I'm not saying that, um, has extremely good frontal armor, however its gun depression is quite lacking, so if you're into that, if you've played the Chinese tanks in uh, World of Tanks, this is basically that. Uh, last but not least, the Asgold light tank gives you the option to either play Stingray wise um, with the ready rack and a turret that can be penetrated or kind of like an expeditionary tank um, in which you are able to have an unmanned turret. Um, other highlights include two tier 8 premiums which I believe are the best premiums in game. Uh, this includes the Terminator Reaper which is basically a faster ram curve without the side armor and without the thermo barracks but better gun depression. Um, and the T-72B3, which is a T-90, um, which is a good tank, so if you've got all the way up to that tank, um, the T-90, which is the T-90A, which is there, the T-72 is basically that, but I believe it has better frontal hull armor, I'm not sure. And also the Object 187 in Tier 7, which is also extremely good. Um, Armored Warfare does do reskins of vehicles. Um, so the TATU Shark reskin or any of that is also quite good, and if you want more Merkavas, there are hundreds of them on sale at this point. This... I mean, generally speaking, uh, so you want to do the PT7, P PT76 first, uh, go through the Shiskin line, and then everything else. And now we will start the Commander's Guide, if you'll give me a minute. So, uh, welcome to my actual account now, as you can see I pretty much have most of the vehicles in game. Um, this will look at the commanders. So from the start off there is a couple of main commanders that you should probably know um, and should probably get in game. This is Sabrina, Victor, Juan, Philip and Freya and if you can get him, Alexander Cortez. And if you can get her, Erin uh, O'Connell. So, first off, first off, Sabrina O'Connell is generally um, a pretty decent tank destroyer commander, um, but also um, a relatively decent AFE commander as well, being able to be assigned to the more battle oriented AFEs, such as the BMP, BMD line, um, the Terminators, if you don't have uh, Victor and maybe a decent light tank commander as well if you're into that. Um, her skills mostly focus on crew damage, um, some visibility and camo, uh, hold traverse, perception, 
some hit points as well, um, and a bit of spotting as well. So, a pretty decent buff. Um, although I wouldn't really recommend using her as an MBT commander, because generally speaking, uh, vehicle armor, uh, spotting, and hot and uh, seeing through everything doesn't really work. And also to note is her module damage increased by 50% as well. This is most of the relevant skills you can take for her. Uh, in all honesty, Lucky Shot isn't particularly. Um, any of these aren't really that good to be honest um, although if you manage to level her up more uh, you can maybe do it a different route if you're looking to do the BMD line of maybe go for Cowboy Factor as well um, but for the most part that's what she's used for. The next up is Victor and Victor is an incredibly devastating commander um, he should be only really specced up um, to do um, crew and module damage um, he gives you um, almost a 10% increase when you uh, when you get in when you get incoming damage. Uh, this can basically mean that your reload can go down from like seven seconds to 6.2 or something, uh, and this is generally the line you want to go down. Um, he is recommended to go on um, Russian and Chinese MBTs um, due to the fact they're very firepower or oriented. Um, and the fact that when you see a commander, um, and, and the fact you get better turret ring and halt traverse and everything, um, for the most part, he's extremely useful um, and is outright devastating in um, situations where you have a Ramker or a uh, Terminator 2 T15, um, the Chieftains with Hash rounds, or just about anything low tier with Hash. Um, you have the ability to do absolutely insane levels of module and crew damage to the point of which you might even be able to knock out vehicles in one hit. So watch out for this guy. Uh, the next to go is Juan, who is a who is the light tank specialist of the game. He gives you um, a five percent maximum crew, um, as well as an as, as well as a ridiculous amount of stability, and he is very useful on the stingrays because he gives you a ten percent. Um, crew stat increase uh, if you have an energy drink and, and this goes for 10 seconds and it can be activated once every 30 seconds so right there you have a pretty much a 10% increase to everything uh, you also get a hell of a lot more stability 2.5 that's 3, 4 point, that's a hell of a lot of stability there um, as well as some uh, vision range increase by 30 meters which is pretty much a, a free rank 1 retrofit and some nice module exp and some nice module damage in there as well. Um, you could possibly spec him up to do this line, however, it isn't particularly worth it. Um, a six percent increase to smoke screens is kind of crap. Um, you could go for personal example if you want, maybe go down there. Um, but for the most part, this is the more generally suitable line. Um, I'm likely to go to fighting spirit all the way over there. Okay, next up is Erin O'Connell, um, the most one of the most overpowered commanders in the game at the moment, and she is purely an AFE commander. Um, do not use her on MBTs because there is no point. Um, as you can see here, everything is almost for... <sighs> Jesus Christ, all of these camo increases. Uh, let me let me give you an example. Um, the Weasel Heart here has a camouflage of 43%. I'm going to put Aaron on, and damn it, game. And she now has 48% camouflage when stopped. That's a 5% increase right there, and this doesn't even have anything on. Um, the results can be outright devastating with a giant 50% buff to the VBL. You get the picture. Um, however, I think she can only be bought. Um, next up is Philip, and Philip is a very Western MBT commander. Um, he gives you a lot of crew stats, um, and works very well with energy drinks. Um, the fact that he stacks with crews means and that he gives you um, module damage, better repair speed and everything. Uh, as well as Amarak hit points makes him very useful on, on Western MBTs such as Challengers, Leopards and Abrams tanks. Um, and for those um, which use full crews on like Chinese and Russian MBTs, 
um, they will generally give them a pretty good buff when it comes to reload time. So he's a very, very good commander. Um, I just need to upgrade him more. Next up is Freya. Um, Freya was the um, commander to use on Russian and Vic uh, Chinese MBTs. However, she can still be used on them. Um, a little more um, mobility or or oriented uh, Victor, but you'll still have the ability to deal better module damage and stuff, as well as the fact that she really helps with turret traverse if, if your vehicle has slow turret traverse. She won't be that much of a good improvement on Philip simply because she doesn't increase your crew stats, and that is really what you want to go for. Um, this is probably the best part of this line you can go through, since a lot of these are just a kind of meaningless um, when you... well, we'll get into that later. But yeah. Um, if you don't have Victor or Philip for any of your MBTs, um, use Freya. She's also very cute as well. And then lastly, we have Alexander Cortez, um, who was, I believe, I believe Hype or Frozy used him for their TADUs um, before the challenges um, became the meta. Um, but basically, he gives you a massive chance of dealing max damage. Okay, let me put it to you this way. On my T14 Armada 152, I will hit the enemies for 1,100 damage every time. That's just about the nutshell of it, really, to be honest. Uh, the rest of the uh, commanders aren't really that particularly useful. Uh, Rashid is uh, missile oriented, but Victor does that better. Catherine um, relies on you getting hit by people, which isn't exactly a good thing. Anthony Diaz, I have no clue what he's supposed to do. The same for Maximilian Koenig, who is there to level up your crews, but if you're there to level up your crews and your commander is bad, well, there you go. Uh, Fyodor is kind of the same as him. Um, and then you have Ionis, who was ripped out by Balance 2.0, and the same for Zatsiev. Uh, Josh Joshua Seagrove is a pretty decent um, TD commander, but I will probably use Sabrina or somebody else. Uh, lastly is everything else in the game. Um, I would like to show you, first off, um, how to make your PvE performance far better than it should be. Okay, what? Do I have an MBT in the game that I have not, like, stacked to death with retrofits? I wonder why is that? Hold on. Ah, there we go. Let's say you're just starting off and you have a T-72 and you're getting wiped by the AI all the time. Um, generally speaking, most of the time um, I do the normal rule, which is repair kit, first aid kit, and fire extinguisher, um, and an energy drink. No, sorry, repair kit, first aid, and you, and the field rebuild kit. Um, this is far more effective than the field maintenance kit simply because uh, you have the ability to basically repair yourself completely. It won't help with damage retro. Um, stuff though. Um, the energy drink um, should only be used for vehicles that have a loader or a full crow simply because you won't get most of the benefit out of there and generally speaking the first aid cabinet and the surplus part crates are the most effective in their entire tier because you have the ability to repair all the damaged components on your vehicle three times and then of course the fire extinguisher is quite useful as well. So if I wanted to do a balance loadout for my T72, um, I would choose a couple of high, high explosive rounds, mostly AP, um, and remember that the heat rounds for the Russian MBTs are absolutely devastating. As you can see here, they deal hellish more damage, uh, basically almost more than 100 more. Um, so let's stack you out. So, I mean, at least go for spare parts. Um, but if you're really hurting, then go for a repair kit. Um, but otherwise, in terms of uh, retrofits, you can't really go wrong with a reinforced ammo rack, which increases your ammo rack durability and reduces the likely chance of detonation. This means that the AI has a harder time ammo racking you. Um, you also get um, better uh, protection for the crew as well, meaning that if you're um, just dying out and you can't afford uh, the heavy weight consumables you can just go with a simple repair kit and first aid kit and these two will very help will, will help you out quite a bit and last but not least um, the repair speed as well um, pioneer kit gives you a 25% increase to your repair speed um, and this can be quite good with Philip as well 
as you can see here, I have pretty much just decked out my 272 to be a lot more survivable in PvE for 200,000, 200,000 for 550,000 credits, which is the price of a tier four. And these are the same throughout the entire game. So there's no, so th so they're not going to be more expensive for bigger tanks. It's just the Mark II retrofits that will happen. Um, otherwise, a lot of the, I believe you'll be able to get all of the Mark I retrofits uh, without having to um, purchase vehicles. But if you want to go um, to the Mark II retrofits, you will have to go through the line at some points. Um, you'll have to unlock vehicles um, and unlock the retrofit as well, I believe. And also, that will also be the same for Commanders too. So it can be a little bit annoying sometimes. Um, apart from that, um, your HQ here is um, just a simple view of all the PvE difficulties you can do. Uh, PvP, a random battle is generally, for the EU times, it's generally around 6pm uh, to 11pm uh, European Standard Time and don't really bother with blocks to be honest. Um, your vehicles is a view of your dealers and everything with all the covered commanders and your inventory um, as you can go to boost and premium here pretty much gives you just about everything you need uh, shows you just about everything in terms of what you have uh, your battalion gives you access to how many people are in your battalion as you can see I'm the only one online okay uh, and finally your dossier shows your stats as you can see I've been working armor warfare quite a bit so I'm almost a 60% win rate uh, Glops is 15 and 7.9 I don't play it that much everything there uh, your statistics gives you access to all the vehicles you've done as you can see here um, I have to play MBTs a lot simply because um, there are quite a few crappy MBT commanders out there, people out there. Uh, and my favourite tier is 6 because I believe it's the best tier in the game. Uh, your vehicles, um, I'm pretty sure you'll know this from World of Tanks being able to select from dealer slash nation if you're in World of Tanks, your tier, your vehicle, battles and wins. Uh, your achievements show everything you have and your history um, also shows you everything as well as you can see there. Cold Strike, uh, your um, wins and everything. And lastly, uh, if you go to replays here, um, this is where you'll be able to import other people's replays and see them as well. So you have to go to, uh, I believe it's um, C, uh, Computer Drive C, Save Games, Armored Warfare replays, and just drag them in. Um, it can be a little bit awkward sometimes, but it generally does work. Um, but anyway, that's it for now, and now we will move on to the tips and tricks on how to use them in battle. So, more often than not, a very common situation in Armored Warfare is that you are presented with multiple opponents to deal with. Um, I would like to show you at least one way on how to handle that. As you can see here, I'm, I'm engaged by an M1A1 which is inferior to my tank. I can penetrate his lower plate while he will have issues engaging me. However, to the right of me is a Challenger. The Challenger has issues penetrating itself. So, in this case, for me, attacking the Challenger frontally would be a mistake. So I'm, but the Abrams has a higher DPM than that Challenger, meaning that if the Challenger gets my attention, he will often screw me over. As you can see here, I'm getting rushed by this Challenger, so I'm going to put my front towards him, and now he's going to start being fired at by that warrior over there. I quickly engage the Abrams because my Challenger, the Challenger 1, has a relatively weak side turret which you can penetrate and so every time that challenger moves up I, I back off meaning that he can't fire at my side and I'm continuing to engage this Abrams as well. As you can see here that challenger made a mistake by not engaging me and going all the way over. The challenger is a difficult vehicle for AFEs to engage because of its high side armor and as you can see that Abrams finally penetrated me. So screw you Abrams. As you can see uh, I bounce on the turret over there, and now I'm searching for weak spots all around. Um, these include on the Abrams, the lower plate. Um, that part I was aiming there, um, which can do damage to the tank and track it at the same time. Uh, the turret cheeks, if you have a high enough penetration gun, and of course the mantle under the gun as well. And you can see that challenge is a relatively difficult opponent for me to engage. Um, 
as you saw there, um, I can only engage um, his turret is green, but his hull is not, so I'm going to keep going up here. And there you go. Screw you to the challenger as well. So hi, I would like to introduce you first of all to, to, to the two concepts in armor warfare. This is known as DPS and DPM. DPS is the amount of damage you can do in a very short while, such as the T-15's missiles, which as you can see there, I have completely destroyed two AI mostly. Whereas DPM is, is referred to damage done in a minute. This can often be either slow firing weapons or weapons that require a long time to do damage, such as the auto cannon there, which is represented by DPS. But at the moment you can see here I am in the T-15 HIFV um, on raiding party. As you can see here, why am I shooting that leopard in the hull? That is because that leopard in the hull has an ammo rack. This ammo rack, however, like, however, well, the leopard has two ammo racks. This is the leopard 2, the leopard 2A5, the leopard 2A4, no, the leopard 2A5, leopard 2A4 Evo, and the leopard 2A6 and leopard 2AX. They all have the same ammo racks and weak spots. The leopard has two weak spots, well, two ammo racks, um, one in the back of the turret, um, which if you explode, um, it will only do 200 damage per second, um, which will not cause the tank to explode. However, the one in the hull is not protected. This means that if you do enough damage to the one in the hull, um, the tank will thus explode um, for all of its hit points. This means that using vehicles um, with Victor, such as the T-15, uh, the Terminator series with Hesh, uh, well, the Chieftains with Hesh, the Terminator series with Firma Barracks, means that you are often able to completely destroy opponents in both PvE and PvE simply by aiming for weak spots such as the Amorax. This often includes places such as the engine deck, uh, which can cause a lasting uh, trickle of hit points to be destroyed from the vehicle, um, which causes that. Um, and you can also cause fires to enemy vehicles as well, um, which loses a tremendous amount of hit points um, and also causes damage to a vehicle's uh, modules as well. This often includes the ammo rack, the engine of course, um, and this is influenced by the module known as the gas tank. If, as, as far as I know, uh, the more damage your, das your gas tank is, the greater the chance there is of you having a fire on board. For the last battle recording of today, I would like to show you a game um, in which many, many mistakes were made by the opposing team. Um, usually when you play Armored Warfare such as this, um, you begin to have a perspective of what to do on the game. So the first thing you look at is the teams. Okay, I have a 9910, I have the highest DPM in my tier, they have a TADU, the TADU has a slower DPM but is more armoured. This means that engaging him in a front fight would be unwise, but if I can get him on the side and I can pummel him, I'll win. The T90 is roughly in the same place as well. They have a Stingray, the Stingray is fast and has a ready rack. This means if, if, if the Stingray gets in a position to penetrate me, it will be a bad idea for me. They have a Leopard 2 AV, which is of no threat, the same for the ERC as well, so I can safely ignore those two. Um, Valster in a, in, in, a, in a TADU is a subscriber of mine, and I've played with him, on, with him on many occasions. We have a BMD4, who is probably going to be the best spotter here, so he needs to stay back. We have an MPT-70, which has a very high initial shot, but a very long reload, and the same, and the same goes for the Sheridan as well. This means in my best interests, I have three support vehicles on my team. Um, they only have one, which is the ERC, so we need to be able to engage them and use those support vehicles as much as we can, basically going as a distraction. I have indicated to my TEDU that I'm going to the middle on the middle on this map, which is the F3, F4 area. This is because this vehicle has missiles, and I am able to use those missiles for gun depression, but as you can see here, our enemy makes a very catastrophic mistake. Um, the TADU goes down at the first, while the T90 goes in second. In my honest opinion, they should have gone down together because that would have spread their fire. For now, this means we are able to concentrate and shoot on these guys one at a time because they are split up while we are not. As you can see here, they, 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 they've now come down to coordinate their firepower, but it has already ended because, like I said before, um, they made a mistake and it has paid them dearly. 
faced with two tanks that are able to fire at them, as well as the fact we're able to utilize our support vehicles as well, they have undergone a very serious mistake. This Leopard 2 as well, um, I believe um, he was possibly coming down to help them, but he was too late. As you can see now, well, unfortunately for him, um, we're able to basically kill all of them. Um, the TATU and the T90 there made a very serious mistake, which was being too aggressive. Aggressiveness is one of the hallmarks of armored warfare, and it's what sets it apart from the other two games. World of Tanks can be very campy and passive aggressive in its behavior. Um, the fact that the RNG determines your shots and is fundamentally pay to win doesn't help either, but the core gameplay is rotten to the core. Uh, the game, more often than not, rewards extremely campy behavior. Um, and letting the RNG to take your shots while, while Armored Warfare is very fast in comparison to World of Tanks slow and is a far more uh, proactive than a reactive game. Um, War Thunder on the other hand, in my, in, in my view, is the most pay to win out of the three. Um, this is because the game allows you, um, if, you're starting, uh, if, if you and a friend are starting off um, and one of you has money, then one of you is able to buy vehicle modules right out of the gate while the other has to suffer for a very long grind. The game also has a hit point system that is shoddy at best with the fact that the game doesn't tell you how strong your hit points or damage of, of, any, of any of your weapons are. Um, this means um, that the game is either one shot or takes forever to kill someone. Um, Armored Warfare doesn't have these problems, you know how strong your weapons are and you can influence that as well. Generally speaking, there are four main types of weapons in the game and I would like to show you. Um, I believe that we have seen the damage that Heshel can do to opponents before, um, but um, the, we can start off with Armored Piercing. Armor piercing is the fastest shell type out there and deals the most reliable damage. As you can see there, it, it is able to penetrate most types of cage armor and ERA, but its penetration decreases at long range. Um, when the shell ricochets, it can shatter, um, but it is able to defeat sloped armor, the second best out of the shell types. This is the default shell type that most um, MBTs are aimed um, around with, um, and it is usually the most ubiquitous shell type in the game. It does, reliable, it does reliable damage, it has very reliable penetration, and most of the time um, you won't need to aim, aim ahead of enemies. The second shell type in the game is Heat Rounds. Heat Rounds function like armor piercing, um, but they are significantly slower. As you can see there, it does 1.1 kilometers a second, while armor piercing does 1.5. A very significant difference there. If I was firing AP at a target that was moving, I wouldn't need to aim in front of him that much, but I would with heat. Heat rounds are normally used when you have an extremely large amount of penetration or when you are facing AFEs because heat rounds have a bonus damage um, of up to 25% and also have a bonus modifier dependent on how thin the armor of an enemy tank is as well. Unfortunately heat rounds suffer from um, lower penetration against composite armor which has a bonus um, defense versus heat and shape charges and they also ricochet a lot more. They also lose their effectiveness against deplique armor, which, which is spaced armor and explosive reactive plates, as well as caged armor as well. The third type of um, weapon in the game is heat rounds, um, sorry, missiles. Missiles are manually guided, meaning you have to be there for the entire time to aim them. Um, this is only present on three vehicles in the game, which I believe is the Merkava the Rosamac M1 and the BVP. Apart from that you have to aim your missiles and these always and these generally have higher penetration than heat rounds. However they have extremely low shell velocity and it will take a while to get there. Um, but on the upside they do a lot of damage. As you can see the Fox there does 428 to 6 to 679. Um, and they can also do a max bonus damage again of 30% depending on how thin the armor is. Um, missiles are the most common um, weapon used by AFEs but, but can also be used by MBTs. Um, this can more often than not be used in a hold down position 
um, where if you are good enough you're able to fire missiles without requiring um, basic line of sight to the enemy you are literally able to just fire them up in the air and then guide them this is very powerful aside from that they also suffer from the um, same disadvantages that heat bounds do um, from ability to composite armor, plique armor, ERA, cage and sloped armor as well the fourth type of shell type in the game is the high explosive round um, I don't believe you need any in, in introduction with that really but there is something that is of note and that is Hess shells which work very fundamentally different than the other games as well this is most this uh, includes thermobaric missiles and the ubiquitous Hess shells and HEP rounds as well which stands for high explosive plastic however the most common vehicles these are used on are the Chieftain and the, and the Terminator series these are basically high explosive shells um, that do a lot more module damage. They also have a greater fire bonus as well um, and when paired up with Victor, I said before in the commander's guide, they are very devastating. However, they also are able to, um, they are not affected by sloped armor as much as the other two type of shape charge shells. Um, this means that a chieftain um, versus a T-64 in close range, um, if the chieftain is able to fire down into sloped armor, it will cause catastrophic damage. That's it for the shell types, and that is it mostly for this introductory guide to Armored Warfare. I hope you enjoyed it, I hope it was of some use, and I will be following up with another guide next week. For now everyone, I would like you all to take care, and to see you all next time. Bye!